Today, we're diving deep into the chilling and profound world of demonic possession with Catholic exorcist Father Vincent Lampert. This is his third time on Capturing Christianity. In this interview, Father Lampert is going to share a few of the demonic encounters that he's personally witnessed, and then he's going to make a vivid connection between those experiences and the truth of Easter. It's going to be a super fascinating interview and show for you today. And also, if you kind of get scared easily, you might want to turn on some lights or maybe even watch this during the day. Uh, just a you know little recommendation. If you've never heard of him before, Father Vincent Lampert is the pastor of St. Michael and St. Peter Parishes in Brookville, Indiana. In 2005, he was appointed the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. He received his training in Rome and is a member of the International Association of Exorcists, and he's also the author of Exorcism, the Battle Against Satan and His Demons. So I'd like to begin, if you don't mind, just jumping right in and asking you about your personal encounters or personal stories about demonic possession or any other uh, related things that you've seen or, or personally experienced. So let's start with this. Can you describe an experience that has sort of removed all doubt for you about the reality of the demonic or the supernatural. Yes, in the 19 years that I've done this ministry, I certainly have countless encounters with the demonic. One that stands out very clearly was a, uh, a woman who had been away from the church for more than 38 years, and her neighbor had convinced her to reconnect with her faith. And she told her neighbors she didn't know if she could do that because she was possessed. But then she agreed to come and talk to me with her friend. And we were sitting having a conversation. And she was telling me how the demonic entered into her life. And then she began to cry. And she looked at me and said, well, can you help me? And I looked her right in the eyes and I said, Jesus is the one who's going to help you. And as soon as I said that, her eyeballs turned green. Her pupils became slanted like a serpent, and a voice comes out of her mouth and says, well, who's he? He has no power over us. And then when I got up immediately and went over and laid my hands on the head of this person, the demon is now manifesting, and these green eyes are looking at me and cussing me out, and I simply began to pray, and then the demon began to shriek and whimper, and then caused the body to collapse to the floor. But again, that notion of the demonic taking over that body, treating it as if it were its own by causing the physical appearance to change. So there's the green eyes again and the slanted pupils. Slanted pupils is in like a kind of like a snake or like a cat. Is that what yep. you're talking about? So think of something reptilian. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. And, and were you the only person in the room that saw this or were there other people that witnessed this as well? The uh, friend of the person witnessed it too. She literally jumped over the table to get away from her friend when the demon manifested. There was another priest in the room with me, and when he witnessed it, he immediately fell to the floor on his knees and began to pray. I've, I've interviewed several exorcists at this point and, and other people that are involved in exorcisms, and from my understanding, one of the reasons why the demons do this is because they want to instill fear in the people that are in the room, um, they're, they're basically trying to maintain control as any, any way that they can. And this is one of the ways that they do that is to instill fear in people so that they'll kind of leave them alone. Do you, do you, do you think that that's why these sorts of things happen when you're performing an exorcism or you're in the presence of someone who is possessed? I think that's part of it because if you can get someone to live in fear, then you can control that person. But I also think there's another reason why the demonic causes these manifestations and puts the body of the human person through different types of affliction. So we know that the human person is created in the image and likeness of God. We think of the incarnation, the greatest thing that God has done for us, he took on human form. The devil had wished before his fall that God would unite his nature with that of the devil. But God chose to unite his nature with humanity in the incarnation. And then the demon could not accept that. And the way that the devil believes that he's indirectly attacking God is by attacking God's greatest creation, namely the human person. Because we know, again, the human person is in the image and likeness of God. 
and the devil, when he afflicts someone through demonic possession, always causes the person to appear as something hideous and grotesque. And again, the devil believes that he's indirectly attacking God himself when he afflicts a human person. So going back to this experience, this, you say, is an experience that removed all doubt for you about the existence or the reality of the demonic and the supernatural. What was it about this experience that did that for you? Was it the seeing the eyes turn different colors and changing shape? Or what, what was it specifically about this encounter that, that removed all doubt for you? It's really more about the power of God at play. You know, one of the things as an exorcist, I don't really pay much attention to what the devil is trying to do in a person's life. I really want to help people realize what God wants to help them do. And to me, what's more amazing during an exorcism is the power of God that is at work. So all these tricks of the devil trying to instill fear fell in comparison to what God wants to do in the life of the person who's now going through demonic possession. And ultimately, God wants to set that person free. So a lot of skeptics, we, we have a lot of skeptics that watch our, our channel. And I'm, I'm sure that people that are watching this now, you don't have to necessarily even like... Uh, call yourself an, uh, a skeptic to to have some sort of skepticism about the the story that the, that you just told. Um, what what are some natural explanations that might explain what you saw? Could it could it be uh, that you guys were misremembering? Could you have been hallucinating? What what are, what are some natural explanations that could have explained what you guys experienced in that room? No, well, I think there's always skeptics in regards to many different things, but it really comes to a question of whether or not one is a believer. Because if one is a believer, then you begin from the perspective that believing is seeing. If one is more of a skeptic, then you're going to say seeing is believing. But again, if one has faith, they don't really have to see. I mean, you think of the story of Thomas in, in the Gospels, and he says he won't believe that Jesus has been raised unless he can see it for himself. And Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So it's really a, just a matter of faith on whether or not people truly believe in the reality of God and also the reality of demonic entities. And to realize that evil spirits are not just a metaphor for humanity's inhumane treatment of one another, but evil truly is personified in what we call the devil and these other evil spirits. So to me, it's really just a question of faith, whether or not one will believe or not. Let's turn now to discuss some some more of uh, the experiences that you've personally had. Can you share a particularly memorable exorcism that you've performed describing the process and then how you saw the power of Christ manifest during the encounter? Now, there's no such thing as an emergency exorcism, at least within the Catholic faith. It's a very deliberate protocol, if you will. So there are very specified steps that are taken because for Catholics, exorcism is a liturgical rite. So there is a prescribed way for it to be performed. So it always begins with a, a complete thorough investigation. Exorcists are trained to be skeptics, meaning that, that I should be the last person to believe that a person is truly dealing with the demonic. So I want to exhaust every other possible explanation for what is happening in the life of a person before labeling that person as being possessed. I would even say that the, her, the church would cause greater harm if she labels someone as being possessed and that label prevents them from getting the true help that they need, either from the mental health profession or from their own medical doctor. So the protocol does require for someone to have some type of a psychiatric evaluation. They're required to have a physical examination by their family doctor. And again, the church is asking these experts, is there something about this person's condition that is outside of your scope, your training, or your understanding that might lead credence to the fact that this is something demonic that the person is going through? You know, then there is a questionnaire that the person has to uh, go through. If it's truly demonic, I want to know what was the entry point? What did the person do that permitted demons to afflict them? Because in reality, for people of faith, we shouldn't have to worry about any type of demonic affliction. If we're living out our relationship with Christ, then the devil's already on the run. 
We don't have to do anything extraordinary to defeat what the devil might be trying to do in our lives. So again, I want to know what that entry point was so that I can help close that doorway and then help that person to reconnect with a more solid relationship with Christ in their life. Step four of the protocol would look for signs that the church says are pretty good indications that a person is dealing with the demonic, the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual, having superhuman strength, elevated perception, and then a negative reaction to anything of a sacred nature. So again, it's a very methodical process before the church reaches the point where she says that an exorcism needs to be performed. So what what is a uh, particularly memorable exorcism that you've performed? Well, other whenever I'm convinced, that, when, I'm convinced that when I'm convinced that it needs to be done, then I will prepare myself. You know, I always tell people that in an exorcism, if people are relying on me, we're in trouble. But if we're relying on the power and the authority of Christ and his name that he's given to the church, that's the right mindset to have. So as a priest, I would celebrate mass. I would spend time in prayer, go to confession, make sure that my spiritual house is in order. And then I will decide where an exorcism will take place, always in a sacred space, church or a chapel, never one-on-one. -on -one. Other people would be present. Myself, the one who's afflicted, they're required to bring a family member or friend along with them. And then I would have other people in the room who would be there to pray as the exorcism is being performed. And then when the rite begins, it's um, blessing the person with holy water, again, reminding ourselves of our baptism into Christ. If you think of Paul's letter to the Romans, are you not aware that we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? It is the recognition that if we're truly living out our baptismal calling, if we're truly putting on Christ each and every day, then the devil really has no influence on us whatsoever. There is the uh, litany of the saints calling upon the saints of the church, those in heaven to be present during this prayer of the church, the recitation of one or more of the Psalms. There are the reading of gospel accounts of Jesus performing exorcisms. Then there are uh, prayers where the priest will lay his hand on the head of the person, invoking the power of God to free this person. There are commands given to the demons to depart. There is also the insufflation prayer, the breathing on the face of the person invoking the Holy Spirit. It's the recognition that wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. So all of these parts of the rite would continue until the demon is cast out. Now, I can tell you that an exorcism that one of the ones I've done over the years, there was a, a priest who brought a, a lady to me who said that she became possessed by going to a cemetery at midnight with some friends and trying to conjure up the spirits of the dead. You know, in the book of Deuteronomy, you know, it, it condemns the practice of consulting the spirits of the dead. And she believed that by doing this, that these demons attached themselves to her. So she's telling me the story. And then she says to me, well, I need to go to the restroom. So she leaves the office, the other priest and I continue to have a conversation. And then I hear a shriek and a scream coming down the hallway where the restroom is. And we go down there and the demon is manifesting. And when we open the door, the demon is glaring at me. Blood is coming out of the mouth of this person. And it's always important to make this statement that whenever a demon possesses a human body, then all the actions of that body are now wholly defined by the demon and no longer by that person. So I wouldn't say that this lady did this or said that. I would say that the demon did it. So the demon is looking at me. Blood is coming out because the demon had bit the person's lower lip and then took the person's hand, put it in the blood. And then in the back of the bathroom, there was a pentagram drawn on the mirror in the restroom with the person's blood. And then the demon is glaring at me and, and begins to howl and shriek and scream. And as blood is gushing out of the person's mouth. Again, going back to that notion of where the demon wants to instill fear 
in those who are witnessing all of this. It's kind of like a child having a temper tantrum who wants the focus to be on them. But again, mm -hmm. during criticism, the church wants to shift the focus away from the demon and more on the power and the glory of God. Well, then in that case, the other priests assisted me in uh, doing the rite of exorcism. So in this case, how, <clears throat> what, a, what sort of methodology did you use to determine that she was possessed? Because this sounds like a person who could be mentally ill or psychotic or had some sort of mental breakdown. Um, it, was what indications? On, it was based on the conversation that we were having prior to that episode taking place and the priest sharing with me the history that he had in working with this person himself. So based on information that I had received prior to all of this, and he even had records where she had had a psychiatric evaluation, she had been to her family doctor. So all of these records were already in place. So I didn't need to do that because that priest mm -hmm. presented these materials to me. Yeah, no, that, that is one thing that I really appreciate about the, the Catholic church is that when it comes to exorcisms, there's a very rigorous methodology that they run through in order to arrive at that determination. I think the last time that you were on, which by the way, we have some people in the live chat asking if this is a rerun. No, this is a, a brand new interview with Father, uh, Father Lampert. And uh, we're going to be looking at the, his experiences and then asking the question, uh, how these contemporary exorcist reports tie into the truth of Easter. So that's what we're, uh, that's where we're going in a little bit after we, uh, talk about some of these experiences that he's had. So, uh, I, I lost the, the train of thought where I was, uh, where I was going with that. So let me instead move on to, uh, another question, which is, uh, in your ministry as an exorcist, you've, uh, well, actually, let me just ask you how many exorcisms, if you could estimate, how many do you think in total that you've done or been a part of? Well, I think people need to have a broader definition of exorcism. Most people are going to think of demonic possession, but that's only one of four types of extraordinary demonic activity. The other three would be demonic infestation, the presence of evil in a location associated with an object or even animals. And we know that animals can be possessed based on chapter five of Mark's gospel. When Jesus casts the demons out of the man possessed by legion, they go into the swine and then they race over the hillside and they drown in the lake. And then there's demonic vexation, which are physical attacks that a person is receiving from a demon. And then there are there is demonic obsession, which are mental attacks. So when you factor in infestation, vexation, obsession, and possession, over the last 19 years, there are thousands of these cases that I have dealt with. Now, true cases of demonic possession are rare. They do happen, but they're not as common as people think they are. Maybe one mm -hmm. out of every 5,000 cases is a true demonic possession. Some of these may have to do with infestation, vexation, or obsession. And again, when I use that term thousands, all of these have been through that close scrutiny of the church, which has led me to believe that this truly is some form of extraordinary demonic activity and the person is not just having some type of psychotic episode in their life. In our previous interview that we did on this, uh, this topic, you mentioned that you had seen also, uh, two other really just wild things, uh, levitation. And then you also mentioned that someone had, uh, climbed up a wall. Could you expound on those experiences? Yeah, I think when people hear that, they think, well, that, how can that really be possible? But I think it's, important to understand a basic of the nature of angels and demons. So you think of the word supernatural. Supernatural only pertains to God. Because if you think about the first 10 words in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what does that tell us about God? In the beginning, God creates time. The heavens, God creates space. The earth, God creates matter. So God is outside of time, space, and matter. And the word supernatural means to be beyond or outside of nature. And that's only God. Now, there are angelic creatures that are fallen, so we call them demons. They're not supernatural. We would say they are preternatural. They can act 
outside of our understanding of nature just based on their angelic nature itself. That's why demons can do things that we would say, well, that's not possible, such as causing a body to levitate or to crawl up the wall like a spider, for example. But again, based on their preternatural abilities, they can certainly do that. And again, but you've, I've witnessed these things. So you've I've witnessed said, someone I, crawling up the wall uh, like a spider. Absolutely. Mm. How, I mean, if you don't mind, just paint, paint a picture for me of what this looks like. Are they, are they fully clothed? They have shoes on. How, how are they climbing a wall with, you know, just shoes in their hands like Spider-Man? <laughs> Again, it's the preternatural ability of a, of a demon because they can act, they can act outside of our understanding of the natural world. Again, mm -hmm. if we were to put things in our perspective of what's possible and what isn't, we would say, well, that's not possible. But for a demonic entity, that truly is possible. Demons can also play on a person's memory and imagination. And because of that, then they can cause us to see things that we would say would be impossible. And again, a part of all of that, again, is to really cause confusion and fear in the mind of the human person. Mm -hmm. And that's what the demon would want to do. Again, causing the person to say, wow, look at what power the devil has. And again, then the focus shifts, shifts onto the demon rather than the power of God that is being played out in the rite of exorcism itself. But again, I think it's good to have a clear distinction between those terms supernatural and preternatural, to be outside of nature or to be beyond our understanding of the natural order. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it could, to me, it seems obvious that it could just be that they are operating according to, to different laws. Um, I've got, I've got a lot more thoughts on that, but I, I wanted to ask you within the past, cause the last time you were on the channel, I think was about three or four years ago between now and then, have you, have you experienced anything that's uh, sort of surprised you or shocked, shocked you with respect to, uh, any, cause you, as I understand it, you've continuing your, you're continuing your exorcism ministry. Has there any, has anything happened between the last time we spoke and now that has uh, been particularly shocking? You know, I continue to work with people, but I would say that I've moved beyond being shocked by what the devil does. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, I think the devil, the devil more, you know, he's mockery. I, there are more Catholic exorcists now in the United States. We get together and we have conversations about their own experiences. When I was appointed back in 05, I was only one of 12 Catholic exorcists in the United States. Now there are more than 300 priests who have been trained in this ministry. And I think the reason the church has trained more priests is because we see faith in decline. And I think when faith is in decline, you know, faith in God will lead us in one direction and a lack of faith in another. And if mm. faith is in decline, then perhaps we see a lot more demonic activity taking place. But I've had, you know, other priests tell me that during an exorcism, demons will ri ridicule and mock them because demons cannot accept the fact that they're, they're being commanded to do something by a creature they consider to be inferior to themselves. Mm -hmm. So they may say to the exorcist, and I've had colleagues tell me that the demon mocked them and said, you stupid monkey, who are you to tell me what to do? Or you dumb lump of clay, how can you tell me what to do? In other words, they're trying to convince everyone that they're in charge and uh, maybe more powerful, or at least on an equal footing with God. And certainly we should never put the devil there. The devil is still a creature, but certainly a creature can never be compared to the creator, God himself. So I think my last question was was probably poorly worded, uh, given that you've been uh, in exorcism ministry for for quite some time. So what would you say? Have you seen anything recently that that would shock a normal person who who is not, you know, engaged in an exorcism ministry? Oh, absolutely. You know, I I had someone show up um, a few months ago at my church, and I was doing a mass service on a weekday. And this person showed up unannounced and uh, had called the secretary and told them that they were possessed and they were coming with a family friend. And I didn't have a chance to talk to them beforehand, but they're sitting in the church in the back pew 
And as the service begins, the demon begins to manifest. And I just mm. prayed to God that the demon would, would remain silent. But then I looked and then this person is having all kinds of bodily contortions. They're looking at me with this hideous grin. And then their tongue starts to come out like a snake. And then they're just making faces at me. Now, some people would say, well, maybe they're just mentally ill. Right. But then, and, and you hadn't done all the all the necessary steps in order to make to it really know what was going on. But I just pray that during, OK, whatever that is. So I'm celebrating mass and of course, they're sitting in the back. So the other people in the church can't see any of this, you know, and so I, I'm celebrating mass and doing the readings from the Bible and all of that. And then I keep looking over there trying to figure out what's going on with this person. And then afterwards, I was able to meet with the person and begin that process of evaluating them and trying to determine if this truly was something demonic. But again, there, you know, most people, if you were in a public setting and somebody started acting like they were possessed, it would, it would terrify you. You'd probably run out of the church and, and get as far away as you could. Yeah, I think so. So let's, let's turn now to, we've, we've talked about some of your experiences and we may swing back around to that, uh, in a little bit, but what, what I thought would be interesting to do for, if you guys don't know, if you're watching this in the future, uh, Easter is just a few days away now, Easter Sunday. And so I was, I had the idea, it, it it'd be interesting to discuss the connections between exorcisms and Easter. Do you think that there are any connections? Do you think that the, the power of Christ resurrection plays any part in your uh, exorcisms at all? How, how do the, how do these two things interlink? Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the things that a priest will use during an exorcism is the crucifix. Now it's, it's an object obviously, but it points to something central to our Christian faith, namely that through his death and resurrection, Christ has destroyed death. So if you think about it, how did death enter into the world? You know, the serpent in the garden in the book of Genesis convinced Adam and Eve to go against God, even said, surely you will not die, you will become like gods. But again, that was a lie, because ultimately by giving in to sin, then death entered into the world. But then Christ destroys death by dying on the cross. He pays the price for our sins. You know, the word redemption means to buy back. So when Christ dies on the cross, he redeems us. He buys us back from the fact that our first parents, Adam and Eve, sold us out by giving in to sin. So Jesus pays that price. So in an exorcism, when the priest holds up a crucifix, He's basically saying to the devil, you have been defeated already. Why do you resist the power and the authority of Christ? Because as Jesus is dying on the cross, he believes that he has won. But the moment of his perceived victory is actually the moment of his defeat. Because then the devil realizes that everything that he had been doing to lead Jesus to the crucifixion was actually playing out according to God's plan. If you recall mm. the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, you know, he goes into the desert where the devil tempts him. And at the end of the account, it says the devil left him for a period. Now, when did the devil really come back on the scene? Is when in the scriptures, the devil enters into Judas, and then Judas betrays Jesus, hands him over to the authorities, who then crucify him and put him to death. And again, the devil believed that somehow he was orchestrating all of these events and that he was actually going to be able to put God to death. But then the devil realizes again that everything that he was doing was working out according to God's plan because the devil may have been cast out of heaven, but he wasn't cast out of creation. God can still use the devil for whatever greater purposes that God may have. Then of course, then the devil begins his attack really against humanity. And that's where the ministry of exorcism comes in, because then the church continues the work of Jesus in combating demonic influence in the lives of people. As I was thinking about this, it almost seems like there's there's two ways in which demonic encounters, demonic possession or exorcisms provide evidence for the truth of Christianity. And there are atheists who are watching this and they're like, this is so silly. Like, how are you, how are you even 
uh, taking this seriously. And I think that we do need to take these accounts, these stories. Um, it's it's not just you, Father Lampert. There's other exorcists. Um, I, I wish there were more of them that were willing to to speak out and come on to these radio shows. I mean, there's a, there's a few that I know of, but um, I think that this is actually going to be a really important aspect of apologetics moving forward. But going back to uh, the point that I was interested in making, and I'd like to get your feedback on. So I think that there are maybe two ways in which uh, exorcism ministries actually provide evidence for the truth of Christianity. So one of them is when you're hearing these accounts of these uh, th- this demonic activity where people are speaking languages that they, that they didn't know, there's a sort of levitation or other, you know, supernatural things that are that are happening. This is all evidence of something that is, as you say, supernatural or preternatural, something that is that goes beyond mere, you know, the natural realm. And I think that that provides evidence for uh, Christianity, probably in particular, because uh, in some of these cases they mention Jesus, or if you mention something related to, to something holy, then they're going to react to it. So that that may be one way, just the, the presence or witnessing some sort of supernatural thing occur during an exorcism might be one way in which that supports the truth of Christianity. But another way that I was thinking about is uh, perhaps the way that you go about it in, in delivering someone from being demon-possessed I think that also plays a part in providing some evidence for the truth of Christianity because what's happening is they're responding in a particular way. And as I understand it, exorcisms, uh, sometimes it can be a quick process, sometimes it can take years. So, But they nev- nevertheless, each time, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong here, there is something that happens every time that you go in and you perform yeah. uh, yes, a, a, a rite. And, uh, and I think that what that shows is if you've got evidence of demon possession— and then you have evidence that there is something that is changing through these different rites, through the crucifix, through, say, holy water, through other, you know, uh, Catholic or, or more broadly Christian uh, means and methods. Then I think that that does provide additional evidence for the truth of Christianity. And as you say, the resurrection, because he he defeated death uh, at that point, that that also, I think, can can provide some evidence for the truth of Christianity. What are your thoughts on those those two aspects providing evidence for Easter. Yeah, because I think in an exorcism, one of the ways we might look at it is that the church is throwing into the face of these demons the very core aspects of our Christian faith that they themselves have rejected. Because demons, you know, the things that, that a priest will use in an exorcism is meant to force them to manifest. Just because somebody is possessed doesn't mean that they're manifesting all the time. It just means that somehow they've entered into the realm of the devil and then something will trigger that demon who is now attached to that person. And the things that will trigger them to manifest will be elements of our of our Christian faith. So like holy water, again, our baptism into Christ, addressing them with the word of God, the recitation of the Psalms, the gospel accounts again. Those are just such core things that the demons have rejected that the church will use to defeat them. So the ministry of exorcism, I think oftentimes it's so misunderstood, but the church is really intensifying core Christian principles, which the demons have rejected, and amplifying that so that they will let go of their hold on their victim. So let's let's turn now to discuss some of the the biblical foundation for exorcisms. Can you share some of the examples from the Gospels where Jesus performs exorcisms? You you mentioned one with the demoniac earlier. So in chapter five of Mark's Gospel, there's the Gerasene demoniac, the man possessed by legion. The man is living in the tombs. Chains won't even hold him. There's the superhuman strength. You know the demons recognized who Jesus is. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come against us before the proper time? So demons, they recognize who Jesus is. They realize he's the son of God. They recognize the truth. They just reject it. So you have the story of the Gerasian demoniac. There's also in Mark's gospel in chapter one, the man with an unclean spirit. Jesus begins to rebuke the demons. And he's, the crowds are amazed by the fact that he speaks with authority that again, he's able to command these evil spirits by virtue of the fact that he is the son of God. You can think of the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter is possessed and Jesus even cast the demon out of 
her daughter from a distance, doesn't even have to be physically present among there. There's also the account of where uh, Jesus will heal a boy that has an unclean spirit. And that's the account in chapter 9 of Luke's Gospel, where the disciples try to cast a demon out. They're not successful. And then the father says to Jesus, well, help him if you can. And Jesus says, well, what do you mean if? And the boy is convulsing on the ground. The demon has hold of him, if you will. Jesus isn't even worried about the demon and the possessed boy. He's more concerned about the father's lack of faith. And then the father makes that great line, well, Lord, I do believe, help my unbelief. And then Jesus cast the demon out. The disciples asked why they weren't able to do it. And then Jesus says, this kind can only be cast out through prayer and fasting. So the church will always examine biblical accounts of Jesus performing exorcisms and then ask the question, what do we learn in, from these stories of Jesus performing exorcisms and how it relates to what the church is doing today? Again, recognizing the, the power and the authority of Christ over these demons, the fact that demons know who Jesus is. So there are many different elements. And in an exorcism, the church is always doing what Christ himself has done. So the church one, we live in imitation of Christ. The things that he did, we will do. And even when Jesus sent his disciples out, he gave them the authority to cast out demons, but also to cure mm -hmm. the sick. So people who are skeptics and would say, well, it's just a mental illness or a person has a physical malady. Jesus makes a clear distinction between demon possession and sickness. And so we need to make that distinction today as well. And again, that thorough process or investigation allows us to know what it is that we're actually dealing with. <clears throat> Earlier, you mentioned that the the crucifix is used in your deliverance ministry. In what ways is it used? Can, can you be uh, shed a little bit more light on that? Do, do you just have one in the room with you? Do you use it and, and press it on the person's uh, like shoulder or arm or, or even head? What, what, what do you, uh, how do you use a crucifix and an exorcism? No, the priest, you know, will always wear a purple stole, sign of the priestly office. The color purple is the color for healing. And obviously if somebody is afflicted by a demon, then they're seeking spiritual healing in their life. The priest uses holy water and then a crucifix. And again, these aren't Catholic lucky charms, if you will. They always point to something greater. So again, the holy water to baptism, to the healing nature of Christ. So there's the purple stole. And then the crucifix, again, reminding us that we're the, when the devil thought he had won, the moment of his perceived victory was his defeat. So it's a handheld crucifix, maybe about six inches tall. And then I will hold it up during, when I say certain prayers. It can be placed on the head of the person as the prayers are being said. But again, it's recognizing the power and the authority of Christ and the power that's found in his name. Because again, there may be people who say, this kind of looks like Catholic magic, if you will. But again, it's always pointing to something greater, and that something greater is Christ himself, who has ultimate power over all creation, including demons. I think it is fascinating, though, that these, you know, uh, you called them, uh, well, it was it was sort of a joke that you called them like lucky charms or whatever. But I mean, it, it is fascinating that they, they nevertheless seem to have power in these situations. I was talking with uh, Father Martin. Uh, Carlos Martins. Remember, uh, Carlos Martins. There you go. Yeah. I was I was talking with him. He was he was mentioning that he at one point was uh, meeting with someone who, uh, was, was demon possessed. I don't know if he knew it at the time, but he, uh, he got a, a drop of holy water on his finger. And while the guy was looking away, he flicked a water droplet on the guy's jacket while he wasn't paying attention. And then he like reacted and started to, uh, it, he had some sort of big reaction to it, even though there was, it, it was impossible for him to even have known that, uh, something, something happened or something, you know, a water droplet of holy water was, was dropped on him. Um, so I find it fascinating that these these things do have an effect. So my, my question is, with the when it comes to the the crucifix, have you seen any one uh, react particularly 
uh, intense to either seeing it or, you know, uh, having it placed on them? Have you seen any uh, reactions like that? Yeah, early on in my ministry, so probably back in about 2007, when I was uh, praying with this young man, his, these two brothers, they were from Mexico, and the one brother asked me to come and visit his brother because he goes, my brother is possessed. He goes, my brother worships Satan every day in his room. He has an altar to Satan in there, and he goes in there and glorifies Satan. So when I arrived at the apartment building, when the young man saw me, he, the demon manifested and ran into the bedroom. And when the brother and I went down into the room and opened the door, this is what I saw. There was no curtains on the window. There were no pictures on the wall. There was no furniture in this room. There was no carpeting. The only thing in the, the floor was covered with broken glass, the completely from one wall to the other. And then there was an altar to Satan in there. And this young man was laying on the broken glass chanting praises to Satan when we opened the door. Just that sense of brokenness. And then when I held up a cross, then the demon began to shriek and scream. And then the demon jumped up and gripped the crucifix out of my hand and threw it across the, the room. It hit the wall and the, the body of Jesus on the crucifix broke off and fell onto the floor. I did an exorcism in the state of Alaska just a few years ago at a request of a bishop up there. And this young lady that was possessed, when I held up the crucifix, the demon looked at me and laughed and goes, your God is dead. And then began to howl and scream. So the crucifix does elicit very strong negative reactions from demons. Hmm. That's, that's, I mean, it's not too, too unexpected, uh, but still, it's just, uh, it's a little bit crazy. I, I'd like to, to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, so the, the interplay between exorcisms and apologetics. So what are some common misconceptions about exorcisms within and outside the church, and then how do you address them? I think one of the biggest ones is whether or not exorcism is now outdated, because there's a lot of people that would say, well, demon possession is, comes out of a primitive, superstitious worldview. Maybe it's a throwback to the time of Christ when mental health issues weren't well understood, maybe mm -hmm. to a time during the Middle Ages, if you will. But a lot of people will look at demon possession, the belief in the devil, as something archaic. And we really shouldn't be asking, is it something archaic, but is it something real? And then that's one of the questions that I try to deal with in the ministry that I do. Because just because something is old or ancient, doesn't mean that it's outdated or no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, would you also say that the, a lot of people think that Catholics or Catholic exorcists don't really do their due diligence when de coming to the determination that someone is possessed? You think that's another misconception? I think that can be. Because again, you know, the Catholic Church doesn't have a monopoly on the practice of exorcism. It's performed in many different other Christian faith traditions, like maybe even other world religions. But the Catholic Church, I think, has a very prescribed way for it to be done. Whereas maybe in other faith traditions, maybe it's just up to the individual pastor to make that determination and then to move forward. But I do think that the, the Catholic Church is more methodical on this approach. And will even entertain the question, you know, is it mental illness? Is this person... Right. Again, asking all of those types of questions without just jumping to the immediate conclusion that this is truly something demonic. I will say that the majority of people that reach out to me today, and I have people reach out to me from all different religious walks of life. They're Catholic, they're non-Catholic, members of other world religions, maybe no faith background whatsoever. But the church does try to reach out and help people because the church believes that exorcism is a ministry of charity. But again, a lot of people will self-diagnose. They believe it's demonic. And if I tell them in working with them that I don't believe they're possessed, that it really is something of a mental health issue, 
they don't always want to accept that. And unfortunately, we live in a world where people can find somebody that will agree with them. Mm -hmm. So there was a man one time in Virginia who told me he was possessed. And then I had been working with him, even was able to connect him with a psychiatrist in his area. But the man goes, well, this is a demon and I know that it is. And if you can't help me, I'll find somebody else. A few months later, he calls me and said, I found a professional exorcist who told me that I'm possessed by seven demons, but it's going to cost $1,500 each to get rid of them. And unfortunately, each demon. The man, each demon. The man <laughs> paid him. He was so desperate and broken. So there are people out there who prey on the on people who believe that they're demon mm. possessed when it really is not the case. And ultimately, I can't force people to agree or disagree with me. I can work with them, give them my expert opinion, if you will. But then it's up to them to either accept or reject that. That's the same way even in our conversation today. There are people that may agree or disagree with the whole notion of demon and demon possession. But I would hope that our discussion would at least challenge people to think about this question in a broader scope. So two, two other questions, and I think we're going to, uh, to start to wrap up the interview. So first question is, uh, again, a lot, we have a lot of skeptics that, that watch the show and that are interested in this topic, but don't really take it too seriously. But the, the question that I've got for you is how do exorcists go about ruling out mental illness in these cases and then eventually conclude that someone is uh, possessed as opposed to just having some sort of, you know, mental chemical imbalance or something along those lines? And I think the answer is that we rely on expert opinions. So even priests today that are being trained to be exorcists, part of that training they bring in, in these courses that they attend, psychiatrists come in, medical doctors come in, and they kind of share their viewpoints. So even though we're not all trained psychiatrists, we do rely on their expert opinion. We do look into what they have to say. So again, we, and if, even if the psychiatrist is a non-believer, that's okay too. Because some people might say, well, you're only going to use the psychiatrist who's a believer, so therefore you're stacking the deck. But the reality is that a psychiatrist who is a non-believer is probably pretty good. Because again, mm -hmm. I'm asking them, is there something about this person's condition that you cannot explain? Now, I don't ask the psychiatrist or the doctor, do you think this person is possessed? I have to make that determination myself, but I want the best possible information that I can get. So the church does rely on experts in these fields to help us as exorcists reach that moral certitude, meaning I believe beyond a doubt that this is truly something of a demonic nature. And then once I truly believe that, then I move forward with the prayers of the church. And it's also true that it isn't necessarily always 100% spiritual or 100% mental. Maybe there's a combination of both at play at the same time. Maybe the person had a demonic episode that caused the mind to fracture, for example. So again, I even worked with a, a, a man one time who was diagnosed as being schizophrenic. He thought it was demonic and I told him it wasn't, but I didn't want to just say, it's not, it's not a demon, you, you have schizophrenia, and then send him on his way. I had a meeting with him, his psychiatrist and caseworker, and when I told in that group to this man, in my opinion, you're not possessed, this is truly schizophrenia. And the psychiatrist says to him, well, father says you're not possessed, how do you respond? And his response was actually kind of interesting. He said, I'm disappointed. And then he looked at the psychiatrist and said, you can put the label on me and tell me that I'm schizophrenic, but you can't tell me why. He goes, if it was the devil, at least I would have my why. And then he got up and walked out of the room. Hmm. So I think there's a lot of people who struggle from mental health issues that are searching for an explanation. And sometimes they settle upon the demonic, even though that may not be the case. So we, we had a super chat sent in. Let's go ahead and uh, and answer this one's from Angel WVM. Do you think exorcism training and experience should be made mandatory when becoming a priest? 
I think uh, when I was in the seminary, so back in the 1980s, that was not a part of our formation, but it is now. Most seminaries will provide some basic course in training on the reality of demons and the ministry of exorcism. So I know that I've spoken at several different seminaries and to men who are being prepared for ordination over the over recent years. So I think the church is kind of listening more. And I think that's also evident in the fact that there is now a training school for exorcists in the United States. So the church is taking this topic more seriously because the church realizes that if mm -hmm. she doesn't address the issue and train future priests on how to address this issue, then people may turn to the wrong sources to get the help that they think they need with the end result that their situation is worse than it was before. All right. So I, I should also mention that if you guys want to send in more super chats, we can uh, do what we can to take those questions or super chats as they come in. Uh, we are sort of uh, going to be wrapping things up pretty soon here, but uh, we should have a little bit more time if you guys uh, want to send some in. So uh, last question that I think I've got for you today. A lot of skeptics will say, well, why don't you just go in with a camera or everyone has, you know, a camera on their phones these days. Why don't you just record something and post it and remove all doubt about the existence of the supernatural? I mean, these could serve if we had it on film could serve as very, very good evidence for the truth uh, or at least the falsity of, of atheism, you know. Um, so why don't uh, why don't we have that? Not not just in catholic exorcisms but like other people that perform exorcisms and in, in other denominations other faiths why don't we have really any video recordings of these sorts of manifestations happening i think the number one reason is it's always to protect protect the identity of the individual because if someone's possessed they may not want to put themselves out there for public display you think in within the catholic world like confession there's kind of the seal of confession is kept confidential to protect the identity of the person and we can apply that to the ministry of exorcism that is really about protecting the identity of that person now we can also look at the fact that people can say they should be recorded but we also live in a world where people say video can be manipulated and whatnot so even if we had these things would people still accept it or would they begin to suggest that somehow things have been modified? And now, at least within the Catholic world, recording exorcisms is not permitted. It's even in the rite itself. Again, that is to protect the identity of the one who has become a victim by the devil. Other faith traditions, why or why they don't do that, then that would be a question up to them. But at least from a mm -hmm. Catholic perspective, it's something that is not permitted to protect the identity of the person. So, I mean, there's not really much that we can do within Catholicism because it's, it's as you say, part of the right. Um, but it, it does seem like there are certain things in, that, that we can do with a video to alter them to protect the identity of, of the individual. So it, it doesn't seem to me to be too big of an issue. So, so for example, we could blur out their face. We could uh, change their voice, make it deeper, change it in, in certain ways to change the inflection. Um, that there's AI programs that can can do that very easily, that can change you know th those those sorts of things. Um, so I think that there would be a way to record something and then, nevertheless, remain or retain the uh, anonymity of the individual. I mean, even even here when we're recounting these stories, um, sometimes you'll change the gender, you'll change the names, uh, mm -hmm. to to protect their their privacy. Um, but I think that we could do that with uh, with with video. But again, with within the Catholic Church, because it's part of the right, there's there's not really much that we can do there. But any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, you're right. You know, technology is changing and advancing at lightning speed. You know, perhaps in the future, the church might re, you know, look into that. But at least for now, and you know, the the right of exorcism. You know, it isn't up to the individual priest to to choose what to do or what not to do. Mm -hmm. Because even one of the things about the ministry of exorcism, the importance of obedience, you know, if, if a priest is being disobedient 
and doing things that the church does not permit, being disobedient and trying to fight the devil is probably not a good combination. One mm. really needs to be obedient to the proper authority, if you will, if one is truly going to be successful, because one cannot be disobedient and try to combat the devil who was also disobedient to God himself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. maybe in the church or in the future, the church might, you know, relook at that again, based on advances in technology and AI and that type of thing. But at least mm -hmm. for now, the church is, and, you know, the thing about the Catholic church, it, it, it maybe it frustrates people, but the church moves very, very slowly. The church thinks in terms of centuries, not necessarily what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. But I, I mean, to kind of come back on that a little bit, I, th I think that the Catholic Church could could reason along similar lines of, of, of the reasoning that's involved with the Shroud of Turin, how they're like, no, you're not going to come in and tear things off again and, and destroy parts of the Shroud um, just to, you know, have scientific results that are going to be overturned in a few years. Like, we're not really going to allow you guys to, to do that. That's kind of what happened when they when they uh, analyzed the Shroud of Turin back in the mm -hmm. 70s or the 80s. And mm -hmm. so they're, they're I, I can see why they might be skeptical that this would be a good practice to start allowing. And it, it, there, there are, I, I think that there would be enough concern because some people could, could start to use it wrongly. You know, they could start to uh, start recording these things and then sell them. I, I don't know. There, there are ways to, to uh, go about using this, this power wrongly. And so I think that might be a concern that that the Catholic Church would have to take into consideration. So there's there's probably going to be it's not it's not as cut and dry as just like hey record it and then we're all going to be convinced that Christianity is true. Maybe maybe I mean maybe because as you say I mean, some people just deny that they're real. Some people still just look at it and be like I don't know what that is, but it's not that Christianity is true. So you may think that if we just had it recorded, then it would just alleviate all these doubts that everyone has, but I, I'm just not super confident that that would be the case. And the thing, the reality too is if they were recorded, would people put the focus where it doesn't need to be? Would people be more focused on the demonic rather than on God? And then if people are watching these videos and it's a true exorcism and demon possession, people could get caught up in that hysteria you could see a lot of people believing that somehow they're possessed or maybe they did something similar. And then again, it could create a widespread hysteria. And again, the focus should always be on our own relationship with Christ. So I'd like to do something different uh, that I was sort of prompted to do as we were going through this. So part of the reason why we do these shows is so that we can try to do what we can to help people that may think that they're struggling with something along these lines or at least point them in the right direction. So how can uh, Christians today effectively arm themselves against spiritual warfare, uh, drawing strength from the resurrection? What, what advice would you have for someone who is uh, maybe concerned that they're dealing with something along these lines? And then... Uh, after you answer, I'd like you to, to, to pray for us in the audience. I think the number one thing is that one should be connected with a church home. You know, one needs to have a church home. They need to, to be functioning within a community. The devil works in isolation. There's a lot of people today, I think, that are isolated. We, many of us walk around maybe just staring at a screen all day long, but that we don't really have a lot of human connection and interaction, I think that's the importance of church because the word church means community. It brings us outside of ourselves and connects us with other people. You know, the devil would operate according to the line divide and conquer, but Christ came to create community. He gave us the church. There's strength in numbers. So I think anybody should make sure that they're connected with some type of a church home, that they're connected with their pastor, who can provide them with pastoral care, guidance, and direction. Because ultimately, God doesn't want anybody to suffer alone. And it shouldn't be that if somebody believes they're dealing with the demonic, they're just looking for a quick fix. They should take advantage of that situation and use that as an opportunity to grow in their relationship with Christ. You know, I always say that we can use what the devil is doing to us to our advantage. Any enemy will only attack us where the enemy believes that we're weak. 
So if the devil is helping people to see a weakness in their spiritual armor, use that to our advantage. We now know where we need to put in some extra time and effort to grow in holiness and virtue and be the people that God wants us to be. So if one is experiencing any type of demonic affliction, rather than running away from it, we should run towards it. But don't run towards it alone. Again, have the support of the church and one's pastor to help you take on that fight. With the end result is that one is stronger in their relationship with the Lord than they were before. And would you mind praying for us and uh, anyone that is watching this that might be uh, afflicted or uh, concerned? Would you, would you mind praying for us? Yeah, happy to do that. So let's pray. Loving God, in a very special way, we ask your blessing upon all of us, upon all those who are listening, upon anyone who may believe that the demonic may be trying to afflict them in any way. We pray that you would be with them, that you would shower them with your power, your graces, and let them know that they are not suffering alone, that you are with them. As we know from Psalm 23, even though we walk through darkness, you are at our side with your rod and your staff to give us comfort. Comfort all those who are afflicted and just let them know that you are with them and you will give them to the strength to overcome these afflictions with the end result that they are even more closer to you than they were before. And we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Father Lampert, for coming back on to... Uh, quickly. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, but I, I appreciate you coming back on. And I, I'm sure that you're excited about uh, Easter weekend. You guys have anything special planned out, well, outside of the... Uh, ordinary things that we do on Easter. <laughs> well, today is, is uh, Holy Thursday, so there's special service tonight, and then Good Friday, and then Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, and so yeah, it's the uh, it's a good time of the year to really f reflect on our relationship with Christ, the power of Christ, and his triumph over death and over the devil himself. Amen. All right, well, thank you again. Father Lampert, it's been a pleasure. Yep. We'll, yes, uh, we'll see you again soon, I'm sure. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you later. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now, and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work. People like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?